there's a dude walking by because I'm like right in front of my back window right now staring at me wondering what in the actual hell I'm doing so what's up what's up dude what's going on back to my channel so first of all my son is sleeping there as per every other video <laughs> so there's that and I also wanted to apologize for my parrot <laughs> um, you guys have noticed in a couple of videos that he is so extremely loud there's not much I can do about it I usually try to film when he's napping during the day but lately he's just been crazy all the time so I apologize if you hear his screaming in the background I can't put him anywhere it just it is what it is also I try not to wear my glasses in videos because they do have like insane glare but like I said everything for me is just thrown off today so I apologize <laughs> Today's video is on a man named Kyle Fleischman. Kyle, just 24 at the time, went out for a night of fun in Charlotte, North Carolina and has never been seen or heard from again. He lived in Charlotte, North Carolina and I am literally maybe three hours not even away from that and he went missing in 2007. Even though it's almost been a full 10 years um, since his disappearance, this is a fairly new case still. I actually remember when all of this happened. I remember seeing it on the news. Um, it was a really, really big deal for North Carolina and obviously especially Charlotte. So Kyle actually studied business administration at Elon University, which is a, another place very, very close to me. He was always described as a very warm, very caring person. He was really easy to get along with. He was just a really down to earth, chill, Dude, he did not have problems with people. He was extremely intelligent, really close with his family, and that just made his disappearance that much harder on everybody involved. So right before his disappearance, his family had actually just found out that his mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer and it took a huge toll on them. He made a vow with his mom that they would beat it together. Kyle and his mom vowed to beat the cancer together. He never would have left. He decided to lift her spirits up a little bit before she was scheduled to have her first surgery. He would take her along with his sister, Noelle, and a couple of his friends to go see a Dane Cook comedy show, which I think is just the sweetest ever. And I know that probably helped her more than he probably ever knew. And it's just, ugh, this is just such an incredibly heartbreaking case. So on November 8th, 2007, Kyle and his mom, his sister Noel, and his best friend Daniel, and I'm going probably to butcher the last name, but I think it's Scagnelli, all met at Daniel's house. They took a cab up to the Dan Cook show. All met at my house, and we, we scheduled for cabs to come over. We knew we'd have a few drinks while we were out. Kyle was his normal self, uh, you know, having a good time, happy, jovial, nothing out of the ordinary in terms of it, his attitude. So after the show, he told his mom, you know, I'm going with a couple of my friends to this really popular place in Uptown Charlotte to go to a place called Buckhead Saloon, which is a really popular place at the time, um, to grab a couple of beers, hang out with friends, and basically just end their great night. This is where things start to become really foggy and questionable, and one thing I do want to state about this case, and it, this does go for every case I've ever done, but a lot of what happened is obviously speculation and um, a lot of the details that I did find were very, very, I, I found very different things depending on the website that I went on and depending on the news article that I read. I mean, times were different, people were different, so I actually tried to contact um, Daniel, the friend that was with him at the time because he runs a Facebook page. Um, unfortunately, I have not had any contact with him as of yet. If anything changes, I will let you know. So I kind of had to do my best at pinpointing what exactly happened and the right um, chain of events that happened that night. So if I do get something wrong, like I always say, please feel free to comment down below. Um, feel free to correct me. I do my absolute best. This one was a very particularly difficult case. So 
now that that's out of the way at 1 a.m daniel decided to go ahead and close out his bar tab it was a weeknight and he didn't want to be out too late work the next day you guys know the deal so when he went to go and find kyle he actually noticed that she was talking to a cute girl and um went up to ask him if you know he was having a good time and wanted to stay or if he was going to go ahead and leave with Daniel. It was obvious to Daniel that Kyle had, you know, met up with some people. He was having a good time. He was talking to this cute girl at the time he was single. So Kyle said that he wanted to stay and Daniel didn't question it and just kind of went on about his night. So this is where things go downhill pretty quickly. So the pieces that they've put together that happened after Daniel left Kyle goes as such. There was a surveillance video that was at Buckhead Saloon that showed Kyle possibly getting into an altercation. It showed him talking to the same girl that he'd been hanging out with earlier in the night and then two or three, depending on different sources that I found, men approached him and it did appear as if they were having some sort of confrontation. Um, I'm obviously it wasn't too bad. There was no like physical fight or anything, but there was clearly some sort of situation going on through the footage. Shortly after that, Kyle is seen leaving the bar. Um, he actually left his debit card and his jacket, and on this specific night, it was about 30 degrees outside. So this leads a lot of people to believe that he had become extremely intoxicated. Daniel did say that the last time he had seen him, he was not extremely intoxicated. I wasn't extremely intoxicated by any means. Sure, I'm sure he was feeling pretty good. Um, I know I was personally, but uh, you know, I don't think he had, had reached the point where where he wasn't aware of his surroundings. I'm sure if he was, Daniel would not have left him to begin with. However, the only thing that doesn't sit well with me is that a lot can happen an hour and a half. Kyle was seen leaving at about 2.20 a.m. So that means since the last time he had seen someone that he actually knew, it had been an hour and a half. I know that I've had my fair share of fun nights out and a lot can happen in an hour and a half. Um, it is very possible that he could have become extremely intoxicated in that time frame. But once again, that's all speculation. The last that someone 100% saw him, he was not intoxicated. So after he left at about 2.20, there's a surveillance footage video showing him speaking to the girl again outside, and they both crossed College Street. It's different, I think the street has a different name now, but at the time it was College Street, and they were seen both walking and talking across the street together. Video then captures Kyle walking out alone, without his coat and debit card. Minutes later, this newly released surveillance video shows Kyle walking toward Fuel Pizza. When someone went into Fuel Pizza to see if anyone had seen him, the cashier said that they absolutely had seen Kyle that night, that they even remembered the type of pizza he got, that it was an everything pizza, like every possible topping was put on it. Kyle's dad, Dick, actually said that that sounded 100% like him. He was that kind of person that basically just ate everything and anything possible. As far as we know, that is the last place he was seen, Fuel Pizza. So one thing that I do want to mention about the whole Fuel Pizza situation that I've yet to see a single person mention is that he had left his debit card and his jacket at Buckhead Saloon. So if he went in his pockets to pay for his pizza, I would think he probably would have noticed that his debit card was gone and would have gone back. So that's a little bit confusing to me makes me question if he was a little bit more intoxicated at this point. Um, maybe he was just starving and grabbed around for some cash like and totally didn't think about his debit card being gone but um, I understand totally forgetting something like that like if I've even had like one or two drinks and I'm just ready to go home at this point like I can totally see myself leaving a jacket or a debit card at the bar. Like that is 100% something that I would do. Um, but however, I also know that if I had stopped to get pizza afterwards, I probably would have noticed when I was trying to pay for it that I had left my debit card and gone back. So that to me is something that I feel like a lot of people haven't touched on yet. And so I just kind of wanted to throw my two cents in there. But once again, all speculation for me. So unfortunately, things get even stranger after this point. Kyle um, starts making a bunch of phone calls. He is making I think he made a total of eight calls, at least once again, that's what I found. He made calls to his dad's like business phone, like in his actual office at work. Um, he made phone calls to his sister, he made phone calls to Daniel, he made phone calls to his roommates. Um, and the strange thing about this is that all of these phone calls were only about like four to eight seconds long, which is only probably enough time for like one to two rings once it actually connects. And he didn't leave a voicemail for any 
single person. A lot of people think he was possibly trying to call to get a ride, which would make sense to me. I don't understand why the phone calls would be so short. I would wait and see if like the last ring woke someone up. So um, I'm not exactly sure what was going through his mind at this point or why he was making these phone calls and nobody else does either. So that is pretty much the last thing known from Kyle was his last phone call at about 328 I think it was. So that was about an hour of making pretty consistent phone calls to people. So the next morning Daniel woke up, noticed the missing calls, um, his father did the same, his sister did the same, no one saw any of these phone calls till the next morning and um, when they called him back it went straight to voicemail showing that his phone had probably died and Daniel immediately knew something was not right because after seeing this missed phone call he looked outside and noticed that Kyle's car was still in his driveway and that sent off a big red flag to him so he ended up calling Kyle's roommates who said he never came home last night and then ended up calling Kyle's parents to tell them that nobody knew where Kyle was. When I realized Kyle's car was still at my house I think that was the initial trigger to me that something was off. So that was when the first missing persons Facebook page was actually created and Daniel created it for him. Literally by later that morning, almost 60,000 people had actually joined this Facebook page. There were hundreds of people that met up to go and look for him. Um, it was a big deal. So within 24 hours of a missing persons report being put in, the police thought the best place to start was actually with cab drivers, which makes perfect sense to me. You know, if he was looking for a ride potentially, um, cab drivers are the way to go. So they contacted all the cab companies sent pictures of Kyle out and they actually did hear from one person. So a cab driver actually did claim to see him and he saw him in not the best part of town. Um, he actually saw him on North Davidson Street. He was walking along the side of the road. He says he remembers him because this kid looked so out of place. He was in a bad, bad neighborhood and he had no jacket on and it was like 30 degrees outside. So after they saw that, they decided to turn to the cell phone calls that Kyle had made and they did not like what they found and this is when they knew some something bad happened to Kyle. When they traced and pinged all of his phone calls, they all showed him walking up North Davidson Street heading towards a place called Cordelia Park. And this park is not a good place. This park at the time was known for a bunch of drug dealers. It was known for being overrun by gang members. Um, it was a very, very rough place. Um, North Davidson Street alone, once you got far enough up it, was a really bad area. And then Cordelia Park was just like the worst of the worst. Just outside of town, on the other side of this bridge, yeah. lies Cordelia Park. It's a haven for drug dealers, but also the stomping ground for what many believe to be America's most notorious gang. So by 4 a.m. they are pretty sure that Kyle's phone was now dead and the last ping was literally feet before the bridge that enters Cordelia Park. Um, the parents were obviously extremely upset. They already knew how bad this side of town was. Um, what seemed to confuse a lot of people is that Kyle knew better than to go in that area. It confused and upset a lot of people because there was literally no reason for him to go this direction. I left the bar, he went to grab a slice of pizza. That makes perfect sense to me. From there, um, if he just wandered off, you know, that doesn't jive well with me. I, I feel like Kyle, was, if he was walking somewhere, it was to try and find a cab. It's actually a pretty long walk from Buckhead Saloon. I checked on Google Maps myself. So it's roughly about two miles away, I think a little less than two miles. It would have taken him probably between 35 to 40 minutes to walk that far. Um, and being so cold outside, that's just a long way to not intentionally walk to me. Um, you know, and being that he knew he wasn't supposed to go in that area, I just find that very interesting and I feel like there's a lot, there's just so many questions about why he was walking there and the distance that it took and the kind of walk, like I even looked, I walked the streets on Google Maps, like I looked at it and you have to intentionally be walking that way. Like I just don't see, I don't see why he would have been doing that when he knew that was not a good area. There were literally hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that went out on their own to search and this is just days afterwards. I'm pretty sure the next day was when they held their first search party um, and he was not found. Two cadaver dogs actually came out to take a look at the situation. They were given the scent of the jacket that he actually had been wearing that night. One of the dogs went the way that 
everyone had pretty much figured out down North Davidson past Fuel Pizza. Um, a strange thing that, that the handler of the dog had noticed is that once they passed a little bit past Fuel Pizza, the dog did a big sort of loop and the second dog that they brought out did the exact same thing. So was he trying to figure out where to go? Was he worried someone was following him? Um, it's just, he just did one big loop on the sidewalk and then kept going the way that he was going. Both dogs ended up at Cordelia Park, which is exactly what the phone calls had led them to. Fortunately, they didn't have a lot of time to search in Cordelia Park itself. Once again, it was overrun by gang members and drug dealers and it became a dangerous situation so the handlers had to call off the dogs, but one of the handlers did actually talk to a homeless man along their walk and the homeless man stated to him that Kyle was in fact killed in Cordelia Park, but he was not sure where the body went. On the street he befriends a homeless man living under an overpass, a man who may lead him straight to Kyle. People spoke to us that would not speak to the police. Uh, I actually talked to a gentleman uh, over by one of the homeless shelters and he told me that uh, Kyle had been killed over at the park and he does not know where his body was taken to. Now, I don't know if there was further investigation into this man and I couldn't find any more on it, but I do think it's interesting that, you know, probably without any prior knowledge, this man essentially stated that he was killed there. So over the next couple of days, they're once again led from Cordelia Park with the dogs to a construction site, which is about 200 yards from one of the entrances of Cordelia Park. And unfortunately, one of the handlers said that the second they stepped foot near this construction site, they smelt the odor of death. And she did say she didn't know the difference between the smell of a dying animal or the smell of a dying human, um, but she just knew something wasn't right. And it was heartbreaking to watch her relive this and talk about it again, about how she ran all over this construction site knowing something wasn't right and they found absolutely nothing. This time Kyle Scent leads them toward a construction site. And as soon as I hit that curb, I smelled the odor of, of death. I ran all over this huge lot like a crazy person trying to locate the source of that odor because I knew that it was something that was dead. I'm not a cadaver dog. I can't tell the difference between a dead cat, a dead dog, a dead skunk, a dead human but I knew that the odor of death was here. As the wind would blow and change directions, you could catch that faint odor, but you never, we couldn't pinpoint where it was. At the time, the construction site was massive mounds of fresh dirt, the perfect place to hide a body. We're 200 yards from the park right now. So, uh, you know, that was what we were afraid of is if he had been killed over there, burying him over here would have been easy. Everything was open and ready. All they had to do was fill it in. It was my gut feeling that day, and it is still my gut feeling today, that at some point for some period of time, Kyle was buried here on this lot. Linda and the dog spent several heart-wrenching days searching through piles of dirt. When we finally left this vacant lot, I looked at Mike and I said, you know, this place is gonna haunt me for a really long time. And it still does own cadaver dogs. I know from what I've seen there were about 17 I think in total. All of them led to Cordelia Park. All of them led to this construction site. They searched all over and they found nothing. There have been multiple, multiple, multiple bodies that have been uncovered in Charlotte um, and not a single person has been Kyle. This guy literally disappeared without a single trace. All that's left of him is the security footage and his phone calls. In 2009, a federal judge actually issued a federal warrant to check a construction site that was at 16th and North Davidson Street. Um, I don't think they found anything, but then again, I don't know because that same federal judge actually sealed the documents to the case off from public. But from my knowledge, a federal warrant cannot be served unless there is probable cause. And probable cause isn't just, oh, I think this happened, or oh, maybe there's this. Maybe there was a federal informant or some sort of evidence or a statement from somebody that led them to do this, which makes me think that they might possibly 
be getting closer to figuring out what happened to Kyle. The ATF is also involved, and when they get involved in cases like this, usually it has something to do with drug violence or gang violence or gun violence from gangs. It all points to one pretty big thing. Thing. The feds did seal off his information and as far as I know it is still sealed and I can't find anything else on it. Um, I think they might have clues as to what happened like actual physical evidence or a statement from somebody and maybe they're just building their case so they're able to prosecute whoever did this. It has been a long time since Kyle went missing. I know I've been to Charlotte a couple times and I remember growing up and hearing about it. It is a beautiful city but there are bad bad places in it. There is a ridiculous amount of violence there. Um, there is a ton of drugs there. There is a ton of gang violence there. Um, however, the weirdest thing that I find is that he was never found. And I feel like if it was gang violence, they wouldn't care enough to hide his body um, so perfectly that it wasn't found. I don't know. You know what I mean? His family or his dad at least does think that he was just a victim of a random robbery. Um, he just ran into the wrong people and ended up killed and maybe they got scared and hit him. The most challenging and the hardest thing to stomach with this is the unknown. When you've lost someone, you want to mourn them and you want to be able to move on and have that closure and we don't have that today. Everybody has a theory as to what happened to Kyle that night. Kyle was a victim of opportunity, just a crime of opportunity. I think they probably tried to rob him and it just unfortunately got out of hand took his life. Who knows what, I'm not sure, but I do think that we lost Kyle that night. You know, that would not surprise me. I definitely think he walked the whole entire way to Cordelia Park. Um, based off of the different pings and the timings of them, I don't think he was in a car. A lot of people seem to think he was like taken right outside Fuel Pizza and driven somewhere. I do not think that's the case. I don't know if he knew someone was following him. Um, I know that the cab driver said that in that specific area, and a lot of people have said in that area at that time of night, it's like a ghost town. No one goes over there at that time of night. Um, I don't think he would have walked that far to find a cab. If it's anything like where I live, you know, that's around closing time for bars and cabs usually in the city that I am in, they will just wait on the sides of the street because they know people are trying to go home and they want that business. So I don't think he would have had to walk that far in attempts to find a cab. So I don't know. I have no idea and no one has any idea why he walked all the way to Cordelia Park, why he was in such a bad place in town. You know, maybe he knew his phone was gonna die so that's why he kept his phone calls all short um maybe he was frantic for help for some reason and called as many people as he possibly can there is just absolutely no telling and unfortunately there's no one coming forward to help anybody out on what happened to kyle all I can say is that I hope because the federal government did take over that they have found something that not a lot of people know of already and they are steps ahead and steps closer to finding out what happened to Kyle, getting justice for him, getting closure for his family, for his friends. You know, it's been heartbreaking to look at the Facebook page that was made and see posts from his own father and his best friend. and. These people didn't even get to say bye to him. You know, there is nothing here. There's no closure. There's nothing. He was a very nice looking, well off man, so to speak, in all of his pictures. It's almost like this vibe he gave off. So I'm worried maybe he walked into drug territory and they saw it as a good opportunity to rob him, not knowing that he had absolutely nothing on him. And he was a big guy. I wouldn't be surprised if he fought back drug dealers it wouldn't surprise me if they had a gun or a knife to protect themselves and ended up killing him with it there is just there's no telling there's so many different things that could have happened to him but all of it's just speculation and i really hope that one day it is eventually solved because it is absolutely heartbreaking to see how bad his parents miss him and how bad his friends miss him and i can only imagine what they have gone through this past almost 10 years now so many people are still just checking in and trying to find out where kyle is because it was a huge huge disappearance in north carolina and 
It's very, very well known. I'm going to go ahead and link his Facebook page down below. Please, if you are in North Carolina and you're watching this, share this video, share his Facebook page. It's like I have literally said it every single video. Someone knows what happened to him. He didn't just disappear into thin air. He was a big guy. He would have been found had he fallen in a river or you know what I mean? Or he died from exposure. Like he would have been found. It is a busy, busy area that he was in and Somebody knows. Someone knows what happened to him. And his parents and authorities have said it is a local crime. Someone in this area knows where he is and knows what happened to him. And I really hope one day somebody finally speaks up and says something because this poor freaking family deserves closure. But thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this week's video. Don't forget to go check out last week's video. It was also a North Carolina missing persons. It has recently been I want to say solved. It's not fully been solved yet, but someone has been charged with the murder of Zeb Quinn. So if you've not seen that yet, go ahead and check it out and give me a huge thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. I do weekly videos on bizarre things that happen, missing persons cases, unsolved murders, all kinds of crazy stuff. So I hope you join the family. Leave me suggestions down below on what you want to see next. Don't forget to follow me on all of my social media. I harass the crap out of everyone on there. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!